Okay, YouTube, let's take a look at finite state machines. A finite state machine is a type of program that emulates a virtual machine that can be in a finite number of states. So you can view this in contrast to Turing machines, which have an infinite number of possible states in theory. Besides having a finite number of states, finite state machines can also receive a finite number of signals or, or inputs, you can call them. Upon receiving an input, the finite state machine may change its states, perform an action, or both. Now, the first example you will find if you Google finite state machines or look on Wikipedia is a turnstile, which is one of these uh, machines. Uh, it's the kind of uh, machine that you find in a train station uh, that is supposed to keep you out if you haven't paid. The machinery that controls a turnstile probably includes a lot of sensors and mechanical elements but the software might very well be modeled using a finite state machine. To, dis to determine the underlying finite state machine, we first need to know which states the turnstile can be in. Uh, for simplicity, we can say it can either be locked or unlocked. Uh, and then we also need to know which signals it can receive. Um, we, uh, we assume that it ca you can either like push on the turnstile uh, or you can uh, pay, so let's call that coin, you put a coin in. So, uh, now that we have the states and the signals, what le what's left is to determine the effect of each, uh, each of the signals have on the finite state mach machine in each of the states. So a simple way to, to write all of these effects is in this kind of table that we have here. Um, so, for example, if you are in the locked state uh, and you put in a coin, then you end up in the unlocked state. On the other hand, if you're in the locked state and you push, nothing changes, you're still in, it's still locked, if it works correctly. If you're in the unlocked state and you put in a coin, you just uh, stay unlocked, the coin is kind of wasted. Um, and if you're in the unlocked state and you push, then you go through and then the turnstile locks. So this kind of uh, finite state machine can also be uh, displayed as um, as a graph that kind of, that looks like this, it's completely equivalent to the table before. Now the circles are the states and the arrows are the actions. Uh, and if we want to model this in code, then it could look something like this. So first we have the states, locked or unlocked. Then we have the types of input, coin or push. And over here we define the finite state machine. It, for now, it just has a state. It's not really doing a lot of interesting things. Um, and then we implement it. First, there's a new function, doesn't really matter. But then we, we define this function that takes care of, uh, of uh, what the finite state machine is supposed to do when it receives a signal. So it needs a mutable reference to self because it's going to change itself uh, depending on uh, on the rules of the finite state machine, and it's going to receive an input. And in this particular case, it's quite simple. Actually, we don't care about the state, but if we get a coin, then we just become unlocked. And e even if we are unlocked in the beginning, then we just stay unlocked. And if we get a push signal, then we turn, turn to locked. So this is a rather simple finite state machine, which is just to show the, the principles. But there are many other examples. So, other than controlling turnstiles, finite state machines can also be used for such things as uh, elevators, vending machines, web shop application, traffic lights, combination locks. They're also kind of used in programming language passes, game playing AI, and more. In the more general case, an, a, finite, a finite state machine may also perform actions on the outside world depending on the state and or input, or modify internal data which in turn can affect the actions or state transitions. So if you have internal data, then it may not technically be a true finite state machine, but, but perhaps it, it will be equivalent to a more powerful variant, such as something called a pushdown automaton. But uh, for our purposes, the distinction is not that important. The important thing is that you think of it as a finite number of states and, and you do actions based on that. It's a way of structuring your program. So to look at a little bit more of an interesting finite state machine, uh, I want to look at an implementation, an, an implementation of a finite state machine 
for reading a binary data stream. Binary data streams that contain multiple types of data will typically require rather complicated log logic to read into a program's data structures. For example, uh, when reading the stream, you might have to check versioning headers and dispatch to different readers depending on what you find, or the length of the data may have to be computed as you're reading the stream. And since uh, everything is just zeros and ones in the stream, it can be hard to tell if you've made a mistake in loading the data. Typically, typically you'll only notice that you've consumed one bit too many or some other mistake at the end of the data processing when your uh, temperature data looks like it came from the sun, something like that. Um, and as programs grow and new software versions are released, this process might be even further complicated by having to handle old versions alongside new versions. So, and this kind of thing with complicated versioning is almost guaranteed to happen for any long running software project. Uh, so it can be very complicated. With that in mind, building your data reader as a finite state machine might be beneficial. It allows a better overview of what happens at what time because we just have a receive function that dispatches to different handlers depending on the state. And adding new functionality could be easier than uh, in, a, in a reader build using tons of if-else statements. So with that said, it can take some getting used to think, uh, some getting used to, to think of any given problem uh, as a finite state machine because it's important to model states and inputs correctly to avoid getting a buggy or overly convoluted program. But to test these ideas, I want to build a finite state machine based data reader for the binary format used in the advent of code uh, for 2021 day 16. Um, so the website has an explanation of the data format, but I'll try to provide my own. And you can always refer to, to the advent of code website if anything is unclear. So just Google advent of code 2021, uh, day 16, if you don't know what I'm talking about. So we will implement, so the, the advent of code problem has a number of different uh, types of uh, binary data streams, but for now we'll just implement a parser for a specific type of, of packet, namely the number packet. It's the simplest type of packet, which uh, will be a, a good way to illustrate the ideas without getting too, too into the weeds. So a number packet is a sequence of bits that represents some specific number. The bits are arranged in the following way. Uh, here you have the, the bit stream, which I've separated into the different parts to make it easier to read. But the first three bits are the versioning number. The next three bits are the packet type ID. And then there follow some number of groups of five bits, uh, which contains the data. And the way you, uh, you read that is that you look at a given group of five bits. If the first bit is a one, then it's not the last packet. Uh, and so we read this and we see, okay, there's a one that means that this is not the last part of the number. So we read four bits, look at the next one, it's a one, okay, this is not the last uh, part of the number. And then we read this one, it's a zero, so it is the last part. And in the end, to form the number of this packet, we combine all these groups of four bits. So we always drop the, the first one. That's just to tell us whether we're in the, uh, in the last or not the last. So our job is to interpret this uh, bit string correctly for any given uh, correct version of the string. And now to do this, yeah, to, to build this final state machine, we first need to identify the states and the signals. Since we're just reading a bit stream, the most uh, natural type of signal is a single bit. And for convenience here, we will, we will represent it as, as a character rather than as an actual bit. But in a, in a proper implementation, you would use a bit because it's, a, a, it's less data. So if we have the signal defined as a single bit or as a character in this case, 
we can then define the states to be reading the version number, reading the type ID, and reading the number parts. Now, the different parts of the number are all identical, and such as, as such, it should be possible to handle them under the same state, except for the last part of the number. So we will therefore add another state for reading the last part of the number. And we also have a done state, uh, which just uh, does nothing. But that's to, uh, to signal that now we're done reading. And the, the finite state machine structure itself uh, will, have a little, will be a little bit more complicated than before. Before we just had, in the turnstile example, we just had the state. Now we also have a pointer. So the pointer is to be understood as where are we in each of these sub packets. So for example, it will start at zero, then it will go to, it will start at zero pointing to this bit, then it will go to one. Uh, or actually, I think in my implementation, it starts at one, we are here, then two, and then three. So the pointer counts how many bits have we read of the current sub packet. And then we know we're reading a version, so we only need three bits. That means that when we have read three bits, we can switch state. So we reset the pointer to, to zero and switch states. And then we, we say <coughs> pointer equals to one, two, three, and then we go to zero. And then pointer equals to one, two, three, four, five, and then we go back to zero and so on. Then we have the, the current, which is a string. And again, in a proper implementation, it would not be a string. It would be uh, just some number of bits. But this current is accumulating all the bits because we see them one at a time. We need to save them somewhere so we can read the, the versioning uh, and the type ID and the data and so on correctly. It's not the only way to do it, uh, but this is how we do it now. So finally, we have the results of the uh, of the passing and as we talked about there are three parts of this number packet there's the versioning number there's the type id and there's the data itself which i just called packet here we model them all as unsigned 64-bit integers uh, just because and the implementation of the this data reader follows the same pattern as the turnstile. We define a receive function that, depending on the state and signal, dispatches to different handlers. So again, there's an initialization function, which we won't worry too much about. Then there's the receive function. And, it, and this time, we, depending on the state, we dispatch to different handlers. So if we, are, if we are currently reading the version, we dispatch the read version handler, and so on and so forth. And here the dispatch doesn't depend on the input. It was kind of reversed from the, from the turnstile. So now let's go through each handler and define them. So in principle, you can, if you had a very good model uh, from the beginning, you can write this function and then just implement each, these functions one by one. So let's look at the read, read version. So. The first thing we do is we accumulate uh, the current uh, the current part of the bit string into this current, and then we say, okay, now I've read one bit more than before, and that happens three times, and when the pointer is equal to three, then we know we are done reading the version, so now we can switch to another state, reset the pointer and uh, pass the, the data that's in here into, uh, into a number. Uh, and this utility function is just basically a very simple uh, parser of a, uh, a binary string into a decimal number. And then we, we clear the current accumulated data so it's, it's free and ready to use for the next uh, part of the packet. Then there's the type ID. And it follows exactly the same pattern. So you could even use the same uh, function if you wanted. Uh, but just for clarity, here we've separated it out. 
but it's the same. You accumulate the, the data, you increase the pointer once you're done. Then you switch to the next state, which in this case is reading the number. Uh, before, So when, once you're done reading the type ID, then you should start reading the number. Again, we reset the pointer, we pass the data, and we clear the, the accumulated binary string. The read number is a little bit more interesting. So if we are at the beginning of a sub packet, you know, one of these five bits, then we need to check on the first, uh, we need to check what the character is. If it's a one, then uh, we, uh, we don't need to change anything. We, we will still be reading a number uh, later, but we just increase the pointer. Now, if again, we're at the first uh, bit and th that bit is zero, then we increase the pointer as always. But now we are we know we are reading the last number. So we train, change the state to that. Now, otherwise, if we're in the middle of reading a number that's not the last number, we accumulate the data, increase the pointer. Once we have five bits, then again, we reset the pointer, we pass the data, and then we add the number onto the current value. Um, in this case, uh, because we are passing it four bits at a time, we need to uh, left shift it by four and, uh, and then add the number on. And then we clear the current. Now, finally, if we are reading the last number, then, uh, then we simply do the same thing again. But once we are done, uh, once we have read that packet, then we can set the state to done. There's no more to read. And just as a simple test case, uh, here is a valid data packet, and you can also easily make more if you want. Um, so we take that a binary data stream. Here is actually a, a stream of characters, but whatever. Uh, and we make a data reader, and then for each character in the stream, we receive it, and the final state machine then passes it. And once we've uh, consumed all the bits, then we can check that we've correctly, uh, correctly passed it. To keep the discussion somewhat short and digestible, we stop here. However, it's certainly possible to write a finite state machine based parser for the full set of packets defined in the advent of code problem. And I will put a link to the GitHub or the GitLab, sorry, repository, uh, where you can see the full implementation. Uh, we run into some additional complexity when doing the full implementation simply because there are more types of packets with additional behaviors. Another source of complexity is that the new types of packets can contain other packets such that a packet is a recursive concept. This means we need to do some bookkeeping to keep track of which packet we're currently working on and which are pending, you can say. And uh, such a recursive system is either model using a recursive passing function, so a passing function that calls itself, or with stacks. And for the finite state machine, the most obvious implementation uses a stack. Uh, the data format in this particular advent of code problem was probably not defined with a finite state machine in mind, but in a practical use case, one might come up with a format that would lead to a more elegant finite state machine implementation. So we've looked a little bit at the power of finite state machines, but needless to say, there's uh, a lot left to explore.